have been in this series called The Changing World. We've been talking about the world changing the last couple weeks. And uh, sometimes uh, the change is not always new, though. <clears throat> so we've been talking about how the world's changing. It's changing really quickly. But sometimes the change is not new. It's really a repeat of the past. It may be new to us, but it's just a repeat. Uh, it's been said, I've heard it said, you probably have too, that uh, if we don't learn from our past, we're destined to repeat it. You heard that, right? And we keep getting married. Anyway, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But yeah, but, uh, yeah I mean, uh, but it's true. If we don't learn from our past, we are destined to repeat it. And that's some of the change we're experiencing in our world. We're, we're experiencing some change, but it's, it's not new. It's really old. And we just apparently haven't learned from our past, which means we're destined to repeat it. And it looks like we're going down that road of repeating it. We don't want that to happen. Uh, in April 12th, 1861, 1861, if that date sounds familiar, our country started the Civil War. Started the Civil War. Horrific time in American history. Uh, there was roughly 750,000 men were killed in the Civil War. It lasted uh, for four years. Four years. Uh, and a lot of people were calling for civil war at that time. A lot of people said, this is a good thing. We have to have civil war. We have to fight this out because if not, our country will never be the same. And we had a civil war and our country has really never been the same. So it didn't produce the results that people hoped it was going to produce at that time, but it produced a lot of heartache, a lot of death, a lot of scars, a lot of bitterness that in the country of America, if you're watching outside in our country, there's people still living in the, the myth or the past of this war, still living in it and making decisions. Uh, a study was done in America in 2021, 20, so it's, it's about three years old, uh, if my math is right, uh, 2021, and one in five Americans, one in five Americans uh, said that violence motivated by, an, a by a political agenda was at least somewhat justifiable. Violence motivated by a political agenda was, at, at the minimum, somewhat justifiable. That's a scary statement. Yeah, you should let that sink in. One out of five. That is almost a quarter of all Americans believe that violence for a political reason is at least somewhat justifiable. Uh, when I heard that statistic, I was like, whoa, wait, what? Uh, it's kind of sobering. Uh, the study studied 9,000 people, so it's not a little study. 9,000 Americans, 9,000 people were surveyed and... Uh, Many of them said, this is another scary, sobering thing, uh, many of them said, at least half, half of the 9,000 said that they were willing to give up some of their democracy and their rights to have a strong leader. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of scary too. Uh, half of them. This is, these are interesting statistics. Uh, and, and honestly, when I, when I look at these statistics, it really sounds more like the 1850s then the 2020s, wherever we're at, 2024, the 1850s. 1850s was the decade prior to the Civil War. It, it was what was happening in this country prior to war breaking out where we started to fight each other. And, and ultimately, at that time, before the Civil War, they had a lot of the same problems that we're dealing with today and the same things we're fighting with today, uh, there were high levels of distrust in elections <laughs> and the belief in who won. Uh, yeah, does that sound familiar? Okay, uh, there was massive amounts of disinformation out there. Okay, uh, there were people calling for separation. There were people calling that we should go into civil war. 
And if you've been around at all, at least since the last election to the current, there's been a murmuring and a growing murmuring that if our candidate, whoever that is, if our candidate doesn't win the election, then it was cheated and we have to go to war and this country should have a civil war. And it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. Both sides are saying the exact same thing and accusing the other side. Both sides are saying there's voter fraud. Both sides are saying that the election is illegal. Both sides are saying the election was stolen. And both sides are saying if my candidate doesn't win, we need to take up arms and fight a war. That, that's a scary place to be. This is what 1850 was like. This is exactly what was happening. And we need to pay attention to this. This is not a new change. This is an old change. And we've already gone down that road, but we haven't learned the lessons, apparently. And we're going right down that road again. It's, it's a scary, scary place. A lot of people died in the Civil War. 750,000 people died during the Civil War. Not to mention all the people who were maimed, lost limbs, all the people who were scarred, all the emotional scars, and how that scar is still in America today. There's still a remnant of fighting this old war because it's been passed down from generation to generation that this is who we are and this is what we're about. And it's still there. A senator in uh, Massachusetts during the Civil War, he was a unionist. This is what he said. He said, if the scene, 750,000 people being killed, if that scene could have been presented to me before the war, anxious as I was for the preservation of the Union, I should have said, the cost is too great. That's what he said. Someone who was very pro, I didn't tell you his name, Senator Harry Wilson of Massachusetts, that's who said that. He was very pro to go to war. We have to hold the Union together. And yet on the other side, he was saying, hmm, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. And the vast majority of people pre, pre the Civil War, war thought, we're just going to go out and we're going to have to fight one or two battles. And we'll establish this is how it's working. And it turned into four years of men being slaughtered. So before maybe we start talking about this idea of civil war, maybe we should step back, calm ourselves a little bit, think about the piles of dead sons and daughters being slaughtered in horrific ways and let that sobering thought take control of our mind before we start shooting our mouths off about civil war and what we should go into. We should let that temper our thinking. Temper our thinking. Because sometimes we get caught up into stuff and we don't think and we just react. Uh, let's look and see what Jesus has to say. Jesus talks about this matter. I, I love Jesus because he, he gets right to it, right? Matthew, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 12. There's white Bibles out there, by the way. Uh, white Bibles out there. Uh, you can take it home if you do not have one, but it will be on the screen. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, starting there. It says, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. Jesus healed the man so that he could both speak and see. Awesome. Jesus does a miracle. That's great. The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? This is exactly who he was, right? Verse 24, but when the Pharisees, this is the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, when, the church people, when the Pharisees heard about the miracles, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. <laughs> Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts, and he replied, Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. Okay, maybe I should read that again, because you want that to sink in. Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Okay, did you hear that? 
that civil war, a civil war will doom us all. A civil war will doom us all. I just want you to, I just want that to sink in. Because I know we get involved and we hear this hype and we think, yeah, yeah. But listen to what Jesus says. A civil war will doom us all. A civil war in your home will doom your home. A civil war in the church will doom the church. A civil war in our country will doom the country. Let that sobering thought sink in, because that's exactly what Jesus just said. There are no winners in a civil war. There are none, right? Don't be misled that a civil war uh, was really about slavery. We've kind of twisted history. Civil war was really not about slavery. That was just an opportunity that President Lincoln took advantage of at that moment, but it really was politically motivated. If you really study your history and look at that, the Civil War was about separation. It was a divorce. It was two married people saying, we're going our separate ways, and one saying, no, you're not. You're not going anywhere. And the other one saying, yeah, I'm out of here. No, you're not. And we're going to fight a war over it. Uh, Horace Greenlee, a reporter of the New York Times during the Civil War, he, he reported, he said this in the paper. He said, we hope never to live in a republic. That's what we live in. Uh, we hope never to live in a republic whereof one section is pinned to the residue by a bayonet. In other words, you're not allowed to leave and we're going to keep you here by force. Robert E. Lee, that name should be familiar to you, he said, I can anticipate no greater calamity for the country than a dissolution, a dissolution of union. Still, a union that can only be maintained by sword and bayonet and in which strife and civil war are to take the place of brotherly love and kindness has no charm for me. This is all the rhetoric that is coming out as the civil war is beginning to happen. I want you to hear their words, what they're saying, what it's really talking about. Don't be mistaken, the civil war was about politics. It was about politics. It was two sides did not agree with each other, and instead of sitting down to resolve it in brotherly love and kindness and recognizing we have differences, it was about we're going to force our view upon you. And it doesn't matter which side you're on. Nobody likes that. You're not going to like it if someone forces their political views upon you, and they're not going to like it if we force our political views upon them. And I get it. There's some, there's some issues. There's some political issues out there. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that there's problems. There are problems. There's, there's problems with Voting certain people, it's going to affect our children, it's going to affect our life. I get that, I understand, but the answer is not war. That's not the answer. The answer is not to pull out guns and use them, that's not the answer. Violence is not the answer. Violence doesn't solve problems, it just creates more problems. It's not healthy for any of us. Uh, and when we have politicians calling for it, that's not a healthy place to be either. When you have news programs calling for it, promoting it, hyping it, that's not a good thing either. Magazines writing about it, predicting it. This is not a healthy thing for any of us. We need to step back as a church, as believers in Jesus, and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this the best method to solve our problems? No, we have Jesus Christ. Why are we not turning to him? He is our source, right? And, and if you want to look at the Bible and Civil War and see what happens, just read 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It's there. Israel went into Civil War, divided into two kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And guess what happened? They both were wiped out. Jesus' words is true. A nation divided is doomed. Is doomed. So what are we going to do? A better America starts with the family. Okay, so how are we going to respond? Well, a better America starts with the family. It starts right here. It starts with our families. It starts inside your home. 
That's where it starts. The Bible says this, Proverbs 22, 6, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. Okay, so mom and dad, we are in charge of our home. And the way we live and the way we interact, we are teaching our children how to live. So we're either going to mentally think about it and we're going to make a choice. Here's what I'm going to do for my children so that when they're old, when they turn 18, when they're moving out, this is what they're going to have in their life. This is what they're going to be like. Or we're just going to say, oh, whatever, good luck. And we're going to live however we want. And guess what? Your kids are going to pick up all your bad habits. You don't, you don't have to teach your bad habits. They pick it up. You know it's true, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I go, well, am I that bad? I got some work I got to do. Wow. <laughs> and so we have to be conscious. What are we? Do I want my kids to be like this? Or am I just going to say, good luck? Am I going to teach my kids about fighting and arguing because that's all they experience? Am I teach them about bitterness and unforgiveness because that's all they experience in the home? Or am I going to make a conscious effort to say, whoa, we are teaching our children and the way they're going to grow up is because of us. So how are we going to teach them? Well, that means we better figure out how to live in peace. Mom and dad, we better figure out how to solve problems. We better figure out how to forgive each other. We better figure out that our home has to be a place of peace. Because if it's not, they're going to grow up in chaos and frustration and anger, and they're going to assume this is the way the world is. And they're going to live that out. That is a problem. We do not want that to happen. It's a bad place to be, right? A very bad place to be. Uh, if you're in your marriage, you chose to be in your marriage, so choose to stay in your marriage. Stay in your marriage. You made a choice. Well, choose to stay. Sometimes it's out of your control. I get it. We go back to the Civil War. It was a choice. One part said, we choose to leave. And the other part said, I refuse to let you to leave. Well, that's the same way in a marriage. So either take the time and do a long dating relationship to know what you're buying. But if you didn't, that's your fault. If you went quick, that's your fault. But you chose to get married, so teach your children about loyalty. Teach your now, listen, I understand there's always exceptions. I understand that you may be in an abusive relationship. I understand, there's exceptions to the rule. I get it. I understand that. But in the normal setting, most people are not leaving because they're in an abusive relationship. Most people are leaving because you won't solve problems. Most people are leaving because I'm just angry and I've had enough. No, let's sit down and let's solve... After you've done everything you possibly can to solve the problem, the other person still may walk away. You can't control that, but at least your children will see on your side you did everything you could do to resolve the problem and stay together. I get that, right? Sometimes it happens, I understand. But most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time we just quit and give up. Don't just quit. Decide, I am going to fight for peace. I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to work for it because it matters to my children. It matters the future they're going to live in. Uh, Mom and dad, you're going to have fights. You're going to get mad at each other. Figure out how to solve the problem. Figure out how to sit down. You have a book that teaches you how to do it. Figure out how to sit down. Figure out how to forgive each other. Figure out how to show brotherly kindness to each other. Figure out how to love each other. Figure out how to respect each other. I'm not saying these are easy things, but we can figure out how to do it together. Maybe in the peaceful times, let's talk about how are we going to handle it when we do get upset. So we come to an agreement and a game plan and then respect each other enough to follow that pattern. We agree that we're going to do this, so okay, we're going to do it now. I mean, we need to take steps. If we don't do it, our children are going to see that, and it's going to affect how they live their life. We have a huge example. If we do not have peace at home, we can never expect peace in our country. It has to start at home. It has to start at home. Uh, just look to our past, our history. 
uh, roughly, I'm just generalizing, and you can argue with me all you want later. <laughs> but I'm talking now. So, historically, right, the 60s, the 60s were a time of rebellion. The 70s were a time of turmoil. The 80s were a time of selfishness. The 90s were a time of rage and violence. And the people who grew up in these generations are the people who are our politicians today. <laughs> and this is what they learned. This is what society taught them. This is what their homes, their mom and dad taught them. You're part of those generations. And yet there are politicians today. All they're doing is living out what they learned at home. And they've used it to their advantage. And they turn against us and manipulate us with, you should hate. You should rebel. You should eliminate them from your life. The same patterns that are taught. And I said, the 90s were rage and violence. What are we doing now? And, and the politicians. Right? That's my generation coming into office and power. We thought the older ones were bad. It's only getting worse. But it's what they've learned and what they've been taught because we did not teach in our home loyalty, brotherly love, kindness, forgiveness, and grace. Mom and Dad, it matters. It matters what we do in the home. A peaceful family, that's where it starts, a peaceful family then brings calmness to our community. A peaceful family then brings calmness to our community. Uh, scripture tells us that Jesus was on a boat in the Sea of Galilee uh, they're sailing across, and all of a sudden a storm came uh, bursting onto the sand. This happens in Galilee. Storms just whip up. Uh, it happens, right? Water was uh, f washing over the boat. The boat is rocking around. Uh, wind's blowing. The, the disciples are running around. Ah! We're going to sink, right? What's going on? And Jesus is taking a nap. And they're like, what's the problem with this deal? He can sleep through, with this guy. He can sleep through anything, right? And they go over and wake him up. Jesus, don't you care? We're drowning. And Jesus, it's just like a parent, right? You got children freaking out, and then they wake up your parents. Normally, we don't wake up that way. What? 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 Oh, it's, it's, it's just a spider. Anyways, no. It's a... But that's how Jesus responds, right? He responds like, what's the deal, guys? Relax. Right? This is what he says. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. Jesus says, why are you afraid? Good question. It's a very good question. Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then Jesus got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and suddenly there was a great calm. Wow. Wow. Did you ever realize that a lot of times in life, there's a lot of people who are running around like a chicken with their head cut off? You know that phrase? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The world is changing. I don't know. Did you see that news story? You know what's going to happen. If this politician gets elected, oh, their view, oh. Oh, we do it all the time. We just point over California and blame it on them, right? You know, oh, these people, what's going on, right? And we run around and we're freaking out. And yet, we are connected with the source who can calm everything. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, what are you so afraid of? Be still. And he calms everything. I, I get it. Things look scary and it's panic. And I, I get it. I get it. The wrong politician is going to affect our life. I'm not disagreeing with that. You have political views. I'm not saying you can't have them. You should have them. You should vote. But don't run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Recognize that politics do not save us. Jesus does. Jesus is the same God today. He is the same God as yesterday. And he is the same God tomorrow. And he's not going to leave us. And Jesus calms the storms. And during the storm, he says, what are you worried about? I'm with you. I'm in the boat. And I'm so relaxed and I'm taking a nap. If I'm not freaking out, why are you freaking out? Just come to me and trust me. Have faith. I know it looks bleak, but God knows what he's doing. I don't always understand what he's doing, but he knows what he's doing. So let's trust in him. 
If we're going to trust in him with our family, then as a church, we need to trust in him. And as a church, if we are calm, we will affect our community. Church, we have to be calm. We cannot freak out over every news story. You're watching too much news. You will not have to be on blood pressure medicine. I'm just kidding. I shouldn't say that. Anyway, so, yeah. some of you will still have to be on blood pressure medicine, but it's not helping, right? Church, we cannot, church, we cannot fly off the handle. We lose control. We are some of the worst people for calling for things like civil war and knee-jerk reacting. We need to say, wait a minute. Let's point to Jesus. Guys, I know the world looks crazy. I know it looks insane. The world is insane, but we have the peace of Jesus Christ in our heart. We know what war is going to look like. It's not a lovely thing. And we know there's already a war waging between the prince of darkness and the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he already won when he died on the cross. We, we already know this. So let's, let's be the church. Of course, the, ch the world is never going to listen to us if we keep being the church as a whole that we have been. Church, we have to rise up. We have to have integrity. We have to think about who we are and how we're teaching each other to follow Christ. We have to understand the image that we're projecting to the world. If we're no different than the world, why would they ever want to listen to us? If we freak out just as much as they do, why would they ever want to listen to us? If we're doing horrible things just like them, why would they ever want to listen to us? We have to clean up our act. We have to understand that we serve an infinite God. And we must submit to his authority in our lives. That means we have to learn to respect our leaders. We have to learn to lift up the principles of God. We have to stop fighting amongst each other. It's just like the family. We are a family. A family divided against itself will fall. If we're rushing off doing our own little cues or, oh, I don't like what they're doing, well, I'm going to do my thing, we're going to fall. We have to stand together. We have to be united. Why would the world ever listen to us when we're not united? Why would they learn from us when we don't live out what we preach? We've got to learn to be forgiving. We've got to learn to show grace. We've got to show kindness. We've got to show mercy. We've got to, we've got to resolve issues within house. And we've got to keep family issues in the family. I mean, the only way the world's going to listen to us is when they respect us. So many of you are running around. Close your mouth. Close your mouth. You have an issue? Go to the person you have the issue with. The Bible teaches us what to do. But you, you don't like the resolve, so we're going to go to civil war? The church has been in civil war since I've been alive. It's, why are we fighting each other so much? If you don't like it, there's probably another church. Go to another church. Follow a leader that you can follow. I don't want to get rid of you, but I'm just saying I don't want to fight with you either. So what are we doing? I mean, the church has to learn to be the church. Do we believe this or not? We only believe it when we get our way? Well, Jesus does a lot that I don't get my way. At some point, I have to say, you're Jesus, and I'm not. Okay, I'm going to go with you. I submit to your authority, whether I like it or not. I don't know all the information. I mean, I'm just saying there's no difference. We have to have peace in our immediate family. We have to have peace in our church family. That's the only way we're going to have credibility and people are going to listen to us. We haven't done that in the history of the church. We haven't done that. So why would people listen to us? They're not going to listen to us about politics. If we can't get along with each other inside, maybe start pointing people towards Jesus and start saying, I'm going to live it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to be the one to step up in my family, in my church, and I'm going to live it. I'm going to do it, right? Uh, when we have peace in our family, when we have peace in our church, then we can bring peace to America. Then we can bring peace. We can, we can bring unity back to America. Do you want to have a unified America? It's a good question. Some people don't want a unified America. Well, we're doomed if we don't have one. A lot of people think it's impossible for America to be unified. 
Well, I, I say we're already doomed if we have that kind of thinking. If we think it's impossible, then we're already doomed. I mean, th there's been plenty of studies that have been done that uh, if two groups think it's impossible to have unity or peace, then it will never happen. They'll never have unity or peace. In fact, there's been studies done in Israel and Palestine. If they don't believe that they can have peace, then they'll always have war. And where are we today? Where are we today, right? So I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, both parties are equally, but I'm saying if they don't believe that there can be peace, then they'll always have war. If we don't believe that America could unify together, then we'll always have war, and we're doomed already. We have to believe that it's possible. When we believe it's possible, studies show, when we believe it's possible, it makes us more willing to sit down and have conversations. Not to go to extremes to say, wait a minute, we do disagree, but let's come together on what we do agree on. Let's find some common ground and let's start building out from there. And yes, there's some differences that we have. I get it. But there's some commonalities that we have too. There, there's some agreements we have too. But we never get there if we think they're just part of the other side and I'm never going to listen to a word they say. They're all horrible, evil people. No, you're just falling in. You're turning into a sheep yourself. And you're listening to what someone else is telling you. Remember, the person we are protesting against, the person we hate, Jesus loves, Jesus cares about. And what's more important to us, that our political candidate wins or that Jesus Christ wins? We have to consider that. And if Jesus allows a storm because he controls the storm, then Jesus has allowed a storm. And we trust Jesus through the storm. Life is not always going to be the way we want it to be. Storms are going to happen. We have to learn to trust Jesus. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. When people's lives please the Lord, listen to this, when people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Well, it's interesting. When people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. When we are a people of faith, when we live according to this book, when we follow God's word, then our enemies will even be at peace with us. Scripture also says, even when they accuse you because you've lived such a way, they'll have nothing to hang their hat on. That's David's translation. <laughs> have nothing to hang their hat on. We have to believe that unity can come to America. We have to believe that we can be one nation under God. That's our foundation, one nation under God. And that, that God is still Jesus Christ. He still exists. He's still working. And I get people reject him, but we can still be one nation under God because if we're not, then we're never going to be a nation anyways. We're already doomed. And we should be fighting for that for our children's sake. We should be changing the world through Jesus Christ for our children's sake. America is a great country, I believe, founded on the principles of Jesus Christ, of godly people who said, the world has destroyed it, we can do something better if we're one nation under God. And I still believe that's true. And they did it for their children so that they would have a better life. We should be willing to have a better family for our children. We should want a better church for our children. We should want a better country for our children. Instead of just saying, who cares? We're dying anyways. We can change the world when we change. Because it can happen through the power of Jesus Christ. Yes, the world is changing quickly but we can lead the change. Think about that. The world is changing quickly, but we can lead the change. And we can point people towards Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, when we get Jesus in people, when we get the word in them, when they accept Jesus Christ, that is when they will change, not before. So we can't expect people who don't believe in Jesus Christ 
to live in a country that's all about Jesus Christ. We have to get Jesus into them first. And the only way they're going to listen to us is if we have the integrity to live out what he says. Let's have a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your truth, Jesus. We thank you for your word. And Lord, uh, we pray that we do not go to war because it will be our sons and daughters who will die in it. Lord, we pray that even though we get so angry at people's views and the craziness of what they do, that we stand on your truth, that we respond differently. We're willing to just not isolate ourselves into our little group, but we're willing to step out and show the love of Jesus Christ, even to people we disagree with. Because, Lord, we're not going to change their mind by protesting. We're not going to change their mind by hating them. We're not going to hate them to Jesus. We're only going to be able to love them to Jesus. And that's what's going to change. And that's hard. And, Lord, we didn't get into this problem overnight, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. We may not see it in our lifetime, but we can establish the foundation that our children can build upon so that they can have one nation under God a nation at peace, and once again, this nation can spread the gospel to Jesus Christ around the whole world, and people can see the difference. Not because of our government, not because of our economics, but because of Jesus Christ. Because it is all about you, Jesus, period. We love you. Transform our homes. Transform our marriages. Let us start to live in peace with each other. We love you, Jesus. We believe in you. We believe that this country can be united again under your power. We look to you to do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.